Hi there, my name is Kendrick, and today I get to interview Michaela. So welcome. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, can you tell us your full type, please? Yeah, so I was just recently typed um, ESFP, and so um, that's FM, S-E-F-I, and then my animals are um, C-P-B-S. I don't know, do I need to go through like what all of those are? <laughs> uh, sure, I mean, yeah, just you can just say, say it. Okay, um, so that would be, my animals would be consume, play, blast, and then sleep uh, demon, and then, yeah. Is that better? <laughs> All right, sweet. And then what did you think and how did you feel when you got the results back? Because you, you're you actually like the rare FM um, oh, yeah. ESFP. Like there's no, but most FM ESFPs are S-E-T-E. And mm -hmm. you don't have a single like S-E-F-I. You're like the first. So how, how does that make you feel? You know, does that make you feel special? Does it make you feel like, like <laughs> what do you think about it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess. Um... I think it would feel a lot more special to me if I um, really under like I truly understood all of my typing. So I'm really new to this, um, to the um, OPS community and just the system in general. So I don't have a really good grasp on on my type yet. So when I got my typing back, it was exciting because it's like, oh, cool! Now I have something that I can really um, research and dig into. Uh, because there's, you know, there's specific categories I can kind of nail it down. Um, and so I was really excited to get that. And then, yeah, the, that, the thing of it being rare was really cool. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, I guess I, yeah, <laughs> it's cool. All right. So my first question for you is your consume. So your lead consume and your consume is S-E-F-I and it's double feminine. You have double feminine consume. Mm -hmm. Um, Feminine S E, feminine F I. What's your experience been like with double feminine S F consume? Like, like, and then if you need examples, let me know and I can. Throw yeah, some I think that would. Yeah, give me some examples. That'd be helpful, please. Sure. Um. So there's different dimensions to consume. So the first one would be, like, when you share your stories with people about yourself. It's like a new story of something mm -hmm. new that happened to you. And then you kind of take them along the journey where like, it's kind of like, oh yeah, I went to this place. I ate this. It tasted yummy. It made me feel good, you know? And then I went, you know, it's like, you know, it's like you take them along the, the journey. Well, mm -hmm. people with blast, they're not going to take you along the journey. They'll just give you like the conclusion, you know? Gotcha. Uh, and then um, part of consume is also taking in the new. So it has to be new. Like it's not something that you already know. It has to be something completely new. Uh, and it's sensory in your case. So it's like physical, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, let's start with that. And oh, oh one, one last thing, sorry. And it's also external self-awareness. So being able to see yourself from a third person perspective. So not, not seeing yourself from the inside, but from the outside. So like being hyper aware of how you come across to the tribe. All right, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I know you said we couldn't do a ton of um, Enneagram talk, but that is uh, what I speak fluently. And I'm a type three in the Enneagram, which is an image type. And um, three is very performance driven and gets a lot of, um, uh, seeks recognition a lot. Sometimes it's through accolades, achievements, um, work. That's kind of like the stereotype of it. Mine is more a little more specific to um, social things. So relationships with people and, and things of that matter. So I would say, yeah, I, I mean, it's sometimes a lot of the time just existing, I feel like, the world is a movie production and and it's of my life <laughs> um it's such a weird thing to admit and i know there's like people think weird i don't know i guess um it doesn't sound very humble to say that but i'm not necessarily saying that i think i am like better than anybody or that um my world is the only thing that matters or i'm the star or whatever it's just that is actually like the the reality in the space that i live in and it's just like i just feel like that i don't know another way of existing outside of that. Um, so it can be like um, a little dissociative a lot, it feels like to me, um, very, it's like, I, I'm i aware when, I, when I'm when i present because I'm so not present so much of the time, it feels very like, um, yeah, like I, I'm experiencing myself experience life, if that makes sense. <laughs> so that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it does. Um, I do have a question in regards to that. So I, I'm an Enneagram 7. Okay. Uh, 
so like adventure and new experience is huge for me. But um, so seven's deadly sin is like is a is a deceit or lying um or like not being truthful something like that, um, and um now the the weird thing is you have your lead fi but it's feminine so it like moves right, um, so, but fi is correlated with like one thing authenticity so mm-hmm. it it has that um contradiction if your anagram three which is the deadly sin with with deceit versus yeah. like authenticity so what's happening with you with that like inner uh contradiction yeah that is um it's a really really big reason why i didn't necessarily identify with the enneagram three at first because most of the things that people were describing as like the metrics that threes use to to like get that praise that they they look for that validation they look for it's all very superficial sounding to me a lot of the time so there was a lot of I was like I don't care about work I don't care about being a superstar athlete like that is not my thing um but I also have a four wing so I'm a three wing four so I have a little bit of four influence that I think kind of colors it um a different way and it makes it more specific to me so um yeah it's like this I I always have this like judginess um when it comes to like my image and what I'm pro- projecting I want to have full control of it like most threes do but there's also like this it's a little bit of like arrogance to what I will claim as like a part of my image and the stuff that I care about and like my my movie of myself or whatever um I'm like very kind of like critical of what that looks like and if it's it doesn't feel like right with me or t- like um, I'm going to use brand for lack of a better word. It doesn't, that's not really how I think of myself all the time, but if it feels like inconclusive to that, I could be like pretty rejecting of it. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I, I the, the, the wing four makes a, a huge difference because yeah. you want to be special and different and authenticity is super important with the wing four as, as mm-hmm. opposed to wing two. Um, so you are sleep last and your Enneagram, Enneagram tree, um, so that's, there's something interesting about the, the correlation between those two. Um, yeah. <laughs> so when I was studying the Enneagram long time ago, um, what I learned is that um, type threes, um, their order of brain usage is emotion. Um, I think the third one is either instinct or logic. I forgot which is the order. I think it's instinct. And then I think the last one is logic. Mm-hmm. But like they... The, apparently the Enneagram three suppress their emotion yeah. purpose because they see it as a weakness, then therefore bringing up the other part of the brain higher. And as a result, you become more equal with all three usage of your brain, you know, because the, the brain has instinct, logic, and emotion, um, you know, like the, like the stem and then all the way to the big cortex. Now your sleep lasts. So it so happens that sleep last means you're not processing your feelings and your thoughts. Instead, you're going to the outside world. So there's like this weird correlation all of a sudden uh, between those two types. Um, how do you see that in yourself? Do you see? Do you feel like you're doing it on purpose or it's almost like because you are the specific sleep last type, it's like by accident, you are not processing your thoughts and your feelings like at a deep level. Uh, and as a result, you become more like um, image conscious from an external perspective. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's funny. I don't know if anyone's ever asked me if I um, suppress or ignore my emotions on purpose. That's an interesting question because I don't know. Um, I think, uh, especially now, like just learning about personality systems and getting typed so many different ways, it's just made me be really like self-reflective and stuff like that. So I think now I have a better chance of knowing if I'm doing it on purpose or not, but I, I really feel like most of the time it's subconscious, right? So um, <clears throat> it's very difficult for me to uh, be involved in an emotional scenario, right? Like something tragic happening in my life, just something of high emotion in my life. And it, it's very, very difficult for me to, I want to say allow myself, but I think it's almost on a subconscious level of allowing myself to sit in that moment and feel those emotions. Um, I, with my personality and how I've operated for so long, dealing with a, well, even just saying it that way, dealing with an emotional situation means that I am doing something to help the situation and fix it. Like that, I didn't know that there were other options and I didn't know that there was other ways of operating, right? So it's just like, something emotional would happen to me and I would be like, 
my body would signal a response. It's like, okay, it's time to figure out how to fix this. It's time to figure out because three is also like a competency type. So you're trying to, I think of competency as kind of like neutralizing um, the situation down to facts and actionable steps, right? It's like, you know that there's emotions there because that's that's what is creating the situation. So at some level I'm feeling it, but instead of allowing myself to like be fully taken by an emotion and an experience, instead of allowing myself to do that, I I will go back into this competency space of like, I I know that there's a discomfort happening here. How do I fix it? Um, what do I need to do? And that can be extended to other people too. It's like, someone is having an experience in front of me and I'm, I want to help them, but it's usually from like a competency space, like a three space. Um, so I don't know, I, I guess, um, I guess sometimes I do feel the conscious effort to suppress my feelings. And that would be a lot of times, like if it's a work thing that's happening and, um, someone needs to like take control or like public speaking or something like that, um, <clears throat> jumping into action is really easy for me. And, believe it or not, I mean, it is sometimes hard to jump into action if you are actually really emotional. So um, I feel like a lot of the times I'm just stepping up to um, fill a role or, or, to, or to, to handle something. And if everybody is emotional and everyone's not able to act on it, then, you know, what, what are we doing? Like something needs to happen, right? So um, I don't know, it's, it's, I guess sometimes it can be more intentional than others, yeah. Gotcha. All right. Uh, and this ties on to my next question, um, um, because it seems like you were using your TE to fix your emotions when you're feeling bad. Um, so the next part of the question is um, actually, again, with um, sleep last. So deep down inside, a lot of ESFPs want to be recognized for their NF sleep, because inside you are NF, like you want to make the world a better place, and you have like deep uh, wisdom and deep feelings emotions um but um i was watching an interview a long time ago between um jessica alba and who's a who's an esfp with double activated um, sleep she's play last and neil strauss which is an author he wrote a book called the game about like pickup artists and stuff and then there was like a little segment where he was like kind of trying to pick her up and stuff and the way he did it was asking her what her values were and then she got like she really loved it, right? Um, because she was talking about her NF, um, essentially. Now, your type three Enneagram, and one of the things that type three Enneagram gets accused of is being shallow. Mm-hmm. Um, and and <clears throat> and NF is essentially the opposite of shallow. You're like deep with deep emotional depth. Um, so what has been your experience like with with that? Like, have you ever been accused of being shallow before or do you is there a part of you that feel like I could be going deeper into my emotion and I could be sharing more of that deeper wisdom about how human emotion works or like what's 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 kind of happening for you (laughs) I don't know if we have enough time to fully encapture like what I want to say about that be your best be your best but I will say being shallow, being emotionless, being not having um, real authentic values and morals. And I would say that is probably the hardest thing I've struggled with my entire life. I think it has been a consistent theme in my life that I have just always, always, I've always thought about that. And I've always felt um, this like, And actually it did get a little bit worse when I got my official typing as a three, because I, you know, I I had now a system that could, um, you know, awaken me to a lot of things and show me, you know, those patterns that kind of fall into that category of being fake or whatever. Um, I don't think that I'm a, I'm a fake person. (laughs) So there's that, but I will, because I, you know, I know objectively what that means. And I don't think I have a lot of those qualities, but you know, personality is real. Ego is real. And the way that I feed my ego does have um, themes of that. So I think, and also a little bit of two of this four influence that I have. um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm constantly trying to find the real in myself a lot, 
but it's really, really difficult, especially knowing that I'm a three and knowing all of that baggage that she kind of just explained about stereotyping of it. Um, it's like, I'm, sometimes I feel like I'm overdoing trying to prove that I'm not that way. And in doing so, I am like freaking out because I'm like, what is actually real and authentic about me? I'm putting like way too much pressure on myself to prove that there is something there. And it's doing the complete opposite of what I wanna do, which is just showing up authentically. So um, it's it's digging for like something deeper. And I think that some, that's not always a bad thing, I don't think, but it's like, yeah, I, I've i always like, and I think a little bit of it too. So if we're gonna like not be so like focused just on me about that, I want to find really real and true and genuine and important at moments in life just generally. So I want it in myself, but I also want that everywhere. Like I, I look for those experiences that will <laughs> give me that. And I, I, I don't know, I guess it's, there is like a big, desire for me to find like the richest parts of everything I guess all right it seems like you are dabbling into it and there is like a part of you that really wants to be able to immerse more but there's like there's that uh, inner battle with like you know putting out uh, an image or performing or achieving so mm -hmm. it's kind of like go fighting against that so probably gonna be your lifelong battle um oh totally yeah, yeah. I've accepted that <laughs> yeah yeah um, so part of having NF sleep, uh, regardless of your type, so ESFPs, INTJs, ENTJs, and ISFPs, uh, you guys all have NF sleep, right? Uh, what I've noticed is that everyone that has NF sleep, and I don't know if you have one of these, or, if, or if, if you don't have one yet, you probably will soon. Everyone that has NF sleep, from what I've seen, even if you told me they don't have one, during the interview, they, told, they might tell me they don't have one, but they're not they have one. <laughs> it's a code. That you, that you adhere to, okay? And it's usually in a form of a quote, okay? Um, so, so and I'll, I'll throw some examples of like growth mindset quotes uh, that I've heard from people of this specific function stack. Um, so, you know, uh, Jocko Willink, he's an ESFP jumper. He said, discipline equals freedom, which is really awesome for ESFPs because, you know, dis discipline is like the hardest thing, um, except for maybe type threes, because like you want to achieve so much that maybe you'll have that discipline. Um, then there's um, Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States. Her saying is, be joyful warriors. Because I think she knows that TE comes across as harsh. So instead of like TEing people all day, let's like, let's be happy people while TEing. You know, I think that's a very good message. And then mm -hmm. Steve Jobs, I think his is um, um, be curious, be foolish or something like that, which I think is really good for like an IJ because like they're close-minded, right? So be curious means like, let's let in the new and then be foolish means like, let, let's be okay with chaos, which is like the opposite of like what IJ wants. Um, like um, my girlfriend is an INTJ also. So for her, it's like uh, discomfort over resentment. So rather be in a discomfort, situ uh, uncomfortable situation rather than feel resentment later on. Um, so do you have any code that you personally uh, use for yourself, whether that be like a growth growth path for your specific type or or like being an ESFP or something that's more like just a standard one? So what, what, what code would you, do you have for yourself? Like a code that you listen to? Yeah, that's, ooh, that's good. My mind kind of went to like a couple different different places. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily a code or, but I think it's kind of getting at like what this, what this thing is, you know, what we're talking about. So I, and I mentioned this in my typing video, I think, um, like what you would want to tell the world or something. And, um, I've always really been like <laughs> this, gosh, I feel like this is going to sound weird, especially with the examples that you gave, but uh, whatever, it's how I actually feel. Um, the the saying that life is suffering right so i think a lot of people hear that and it's like life is suffering like that sounds like an awful quote like it sounds miserable but i actually think that like acknowledging that life like in stand like standard by standard is hard and difficult and suffering and you're gonna suffer like that's the default i think if you acknowledge that and don't run from that then those moments that are not full of suffering are that much sweeter right and like 
knowing that like life is going to not like necessarily play friendly with you all of the time, it allows you to be easier on yourself too, right? It's like this life wasn't designed to be always easy all the time. So I can't beat myself up about not creating this perfect life all of the time and for life not going perfectly. Like that is actually more normal than whatever, you know, hardships I'm falling on right now that I'm like wallowing in self-pity about. It's like, that is actually the normal. And the moments when I'm not feeling something like that, that's the good stuff. That's the sweet stuff. Like that's the exception. Um, so that was kind of like where I first went when you asked this question, but, and then like general, like patterns of thinking is that I think could maybe fall into like a, a code or something is I, which is, it's not so much different than what I just explained to you, but I very, very, very much value, um, like when I have, like, I'm, I'm going through a hard time, right. Or something like that, because I know all of the character development that's going to come out of that is going to make me a better person. So I'm almost, I wouldn't say I seek out to like go through like hard stuff, but I, I would rather that than have, no challenges ever. Right. Because then I just feel like there's no, there's no growth happening. And I live for those moments, like finding the Enneagram and like getting my typing and learning about personality systems, like that, uh, altered my reality pretty much because it woke me up to so much about myself. And it was actually really difficult at first and really hard. And I had to make some really big life changes. And I had to get like a negative, I had a negative perception of myself for a little while when I first, um, learned it. And all that really sucked. But then like coming out of it, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad I went through all that awful stuff because now I feel so much more like aware of myself. And I feel like, you know, kind of like a new world ish has been open for me. So um, it's not, a, that's like not a specific code, but I feel like that's alluding to a code I would fall under. If something could encap like encapsulate what I just told you, that would be my code. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's good. I like that code actually. It's it's really yeah. good. I, I I um I I pretty much um believe that because like one of my favorite um author uh person ever is um an ESFP. His uh what's his name again? He's uh David Goggins. And mm. um he's like the ESFP superhero and he's like always suffering because he's always putting himself in like bad situations. And then David Shan said that he must be the happiest person in the world. Cause like like you said, everything else is sweeter when you've gone through hell, right? So uh, yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, so I'm like, damn, I'm like, that's like for me, I love trekking because like I get my ass kicked and then I come back and I eat like food. I'm like, oh, it tastes so much better, you know? Yes. So, yeah, you get it. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to move on to your blast. Um, so you're very well spoken, and I think it's not a coincidence because you also have double masculine and ITE. Your blast is double masculine, um, and T blast. So you can, you are going to come across very INTG like. Um, because of that. Um, and it's it's also NT, so it's like problem solving. So would you say, because, so usually when someone has like a double masculine animal, they have like a layer of like confidence about it. So do you feel like when you are, let's say at work or you're with your friends and family and there's like a problem and you're like helping them solve that problem, do you, do you feel yourself having like that sense of like super confidence that you know the solution to the problem? And then because your boss is double masculine, you, are you able to convey that message verbally really well? You know, like how, what's your take with that? Ooh, yeah, that's interesting. So like, yeah, I'm processing in real time, my typing, what you're telling me about it. Cause like I said, my knowledge is limited, but wow. Yes. Um, I would say so. I would say my only like pushback on that is if I actually don't think I have a solution, right? Like, I'm not going to lie. I would never, that's like, that feels very, um, um, difficult for me. Like I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't offer a fake solution ever just to say, like, I know what to do. If I knew what to do though, if I was sure of it, like if I was sure of how to solve a problem, yeah, I would be like pretty overly confident about it. And I think I, um, it would be really, really important for me to articulate it well. Um, whether or not I actually do that, I guess would be for whoever I'm with, but it would be, um, I do feel like I, I could do it well if I, if I knew the actual solution and, um, I would have, I would definitely have confidence about being able to, to talk about it. Yeah. So 
Um, for what you said that you would only give a solution to someone if you absolutely knew the information you're going to give or the solution you're going to give to someone, you're info dominant. So you're not going to make up like, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you might forget the sensory because you're feminine sensory, but in general, you would be, you would try your best to be as accurate as possible. Um, let's talk about you being info dominant and obsessing with accuracy of information. Um, you know, what they say about info dominant people is knowledge is power. Can you share a little bit about your obsession with information accuracy and making oh, sure that you don't make anything up and everything's like as precise as possible, you know? Yeah, um, I am very, very discriminatory about where I get information and I always have been. I have never, okay, I don't know how to <laughs> convey this, but I don't listen to just anybody, right? But if there is somebody for some, it's almost a like unidentifiable for me reason why I will place trust in the people that I place trust in. But when I do, I can, it's like I am so locked in on the information that they're telling me that I become discriminatory of everybody else. So like I, that sounds, <clears throat> but I'm I'm being very like, aware and strategic of that. So like, how do I give an example? Okay. So like with my Enneagram content, how I found the group that I got typed in and the group that I get most of my information from, um, I got into the Enneagram and it was just like generic memes and stuff that people were sharing. Like it was very high level. I wasn't really connecting with any of the information, but I followed it on Instagram. I followed the hashtag Enneagram on Instagram. And I never really followed any accounts, just kind of looked at it, didn't really put a lot of thought into it. Then I came across this Instagram account that was, they were doing memes of the, um, of the different types, but they were like being really mean about it and they weren't sugarcoating it like most Enneagram accounts do and all this positive reframing, making your type, you know, love your type unconditionally, no matter what. Yeah, whatever. But you also like can be an asshole because of it. So you need to like check yourself. Like that's the point of this. It's inner work. So anyway. This Instagram account that I started following was really like dragging some of the types and dragging three in a way that actually hurt me. And I'm like, oh shit, like they actually hurt my feelings. Like they're being real and straight up about this. So then I followed their content and it's like, it's the best out there. And now I'm very, very, very judgmental of information that doesn't live up to that quality, I guess. So I do that with a lot of stuff. And um, like, <laughs> life coach type people. Like I'm pretty discriminatory about them as well. Like a lot of them, I'm just like, Ugh. but then I'll find like, for some reason, I'm like really love Brene Brown. Like her content really resonated with me. And I think she's really, really smart. And I love the way that she communicates. So I'm like a diehard on her stuff too. So, um, I just don't, because I feel like it's actually working. Like the stuff that like the people that I put a lot of trust in and the information sources that I put a lot of trust in, I see that it works. It works for me and I've tried it and it works. Or there's just like something a little more tangible than just information going out all the time. You know, does that make sense? I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's it's pretty good. Um, I love Brene Brown also. Um, yeah. I think maybe you like her because she is also NF last like you are. Um, I don't know if you know her type, but she is um, an ISTJ, uh, blast play, um, sleep consume last, and um, she learned to consume and use her NF. Um, so maybe that's like yeah. inspiration for you to also be able to tap into your NF eventually because someone else figured yeah. it out. Um, and um, that Enneagram group that you mentioned sounds pretty cool. So you'll have to send me their link. Um, I I do like the, the tough love kind of um method as well so yeah. so send it my way um I will. I will. yeah what's up oh no I was, I was just saying I will but I also will say just I think maybe to add on to that because I think it's important when I find a source um of information that I really really trust like the Enneagram one or Brene Brown who I've done this with too I become like the biggest ambassador for them like I won't let it go like my friends know this about me too same with products like I'm I'm big into skin skincare and hair products and stuff like that I will like broken record something if I know it'll work and a lot of it a lot of the times too it's like people it's my friends coming to me with the same questions over and over again I'm like I've told you 
this is what works. And I've told you over and over again. And if you just want to complain to complain, that's fine. But I have a solution for you. And I've told you many times and it's going to work. So um, yeah, that's one of my, with information too. If it's good and accurate, I will like, I've broken record of it. Yeah. It sounds like you're offending uh, the TI people with your TE solutions. Because they, they, and you have masculine TE too. So you're going to come across as very like overwhelming or or like, you know, like you're someone that's like trying to overwhelm them. With, with... I warn them. I warn them beforehand. And I, I don't do this with everything. That's the thing too. Like I, like yeah. I was talking about, I don't just like go and offer information <clears throat> and I will preface it. If I'm like, this is the solution I have for X. If you're looking for X and Y, I might not know why, but I have X. So yeah. it might work. You know what I mean? Like, but I just would never like, I don't know. I, I can't like push false stuff or stuff that I'm not certain of. Um, Dave and Shan, I don't know if you've seen their, like a lot of their videos in their classes, but they also make fun of like all the time. So maybe that's why you, you also resonate maybe with them because they're not like sugarcoating. It's like, yeah. oh no, the INFJ, the rarest type. They're, and then in the, in the class, they're like, they're not the rarest type. There's a lot of them. They just mistype of something else, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, that's uh, what's that? I said, yeah, that could be a good reason, actually. <laughs> yeah, because like people just want to be special. And then like they make fun of ESFPs a lot. They're like, they're like, why do ESFPs want to be like an INTJ? Because like they're like, for some reason, ESFP is not like not cool in like the personality space, but like in the real world, they're the coolest people. So they're like, I don't know what's wrong with these people. They just want to bandwagon with like what's cool, you know? So yeah. Um, yeah, I get that about I think with one with my type too, like, I don't know, people threes get a lot of hate. Because they can be very obnoxious and very cringy. Every type can be, but they just do it a little louder for yeah. certain reasons. So, like, um, I I do, I have shame. But mine, I mean, my shame around being a three is a little more than, um, like, what I was telling you about authenticity and stuff. It's not so much that everybody hates on it, that whatever. I kind of don't really care. But, like, the fact that, you know, I have my own issues with it. But I think, yeah, I've never really... I've never really like cared that, I don't know, I, that's a weird, that's always been a weird thing for me. It's like everybody wants to be it just because it's different. Like I would rather just actually know what I am, you know? I don't know. I don't get the trying to make yourself fit into something that it's not so that it, you're a more unique type. It's like, <laughs> but it's not really you. <laughs> right. I, I tend to um like threes and eights because they're really extreme. So, like, I, I can't hang out with, like, normal people. Like, I do like the nines and twos as well. But, like, in general, I prefer to I gravitate towards, like, extreme people. And, like, I have a lot of three friends and eights because they're, like, super extreme. Like, the eights are, like, super aggressive. And the threes are, like, obsessive with winning. So, I think it's, like... Yeah, I think, and you're a seven, right? You said you're a seven? Yeah, sevens are also extreme, but in, like, a different way. You know? So, you're, those are all three assertive types. It's probably okay. why, yes. Yeah, assertive yeah. types, they're, like moving against people um into action so yeah. probably yeah could be why yeah <laughs> i'm a seven eight so like yesterday i was in costco and someone tried to budge in the line and like i i bitched him out <laughs> in front of yeah. everybody and <laughs> my girlfriend's like oh my god and i'm like because my girlfriend's like a type two right so she must be like friendly and stuff and mm. and i'm like no you can't let people run over you you know you gotta yeah. you know set your boundaries but um, anyways, let's go to your play now. Um, your play is double activated, ST play. Uh, let's go over the different dimensions of it. The first one I want to go over is the. Let's start with the something funny. Um, ST play is a lot of dad jokes. Um, mm -hmm. do you like lame dad jokes and those kind of stuff? <laughs> like, what's what's kind of been your experience with that? Um, do I like lame dad jokes? If they're funny, sure. Um, <laughs> I think I, I've always had, I've, I've had a pretty like low bar for humor, I think as like, as an entry, right? Like stupid stuff. Yeah, totally easy stuff makes me laugh. It's just, it's not very hard to make me laugh, but I will say also like, I appreciate humor that isn't so easy and humor that makes you think and that you know, is a little more like thought provoking, but, um, you know, I like them both. Why not both? I guess is what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's different plays, right? So I, I do find with types, there is like a, a head butting sometimes with, 
um so another type with like for example i have anti play which is the most offensive of all the mm. all the jokes right like uh, i don't know if have you seen borat the movie you know like mm. like that's anti play right such about baron cohen is an enfp so like yeah. you know it's like over the top offensive but then like you know and then you can go down to like sf and nf jokes who are more like friendly right you know yeah, yeah. yeah okay yeah that checks out i definitely i have a i have a much lower tolerance for jokes that are like purposefully offensive i get the humor and i really do but yeah. like watching it um like if it's a whole set like a comedian's whole set or like a whole movie i'm like oh my god I just need a break <laughs> because it's yeah. like it's funny but it's also like it's stressful which is kind of part of why it's funny but then yeah. it's like you just need a break in the stress <laughs> so you're a double decider so you're balanced with self and tribe um when you watch those offensive jokes is there a part of you that's also sensing the room around you where like oh my god like mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't imagine like all the people getting offended right now like you, you might personally think it's funny but yeah. you know like oh, you're, totally. yeah like you're keeping eye on the tribe and stuff um, yeah. And I'm also, so I'm a social type too, um, in the, the Enneagrams of a social three, which is like doubling up on being aware of people's like perceptions and what's going on in the environment. So I'm always hyper aware of that. And I, I definitely can recall that throughout my whole life, but, um, yeah, there, I do, I also have a, you know, a little protection around what things I actually admit to thinking are funny. <laughs> if I think that they're super offensive or that someone will be really upset that I think it's funny, they don't need to know that I laughed. It's fine. <laughs> oh, so you have the ability to keep the FI self amusing to yourself if you need to. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, so um, I want to ask you actually about um being self above tribe um so your type is interesting because you have masculine te and it's double activated but then you're self above tribe so it almost feels like you're almost in the middle with self and others um and like dave for example he said that even though he's self above tribe because he has double activated te he can't help but think of other people and think of a, a solution to help fix other people's problem and he said that pisses him off because he wants to be selfish and do stuff for himself but then he can't help but think about other people and yours is going to be a little bit even more extreme because you're masculine te uh, and feminine fi so what has been your experience like with like being selfish wanting to just benefit yourself but then still wanting to help other people because you have that masculine te so it almost feels like there's like a gravitational pull towards like helping other people even if you want to be selfish <clears throat> yeah totally um i man that's a good question so when it comes to that, I feel it deeply. I just know myself. I pretty much always go for myself. Um, and that was something I had, I used to have like a lot of shame around because I, I am, you know, in that middle space of knowing that, you know, people that's, I could be of service to someone, I guess. Right. Like knowing I'm, I'm very aware and hyper aware of that. And I'm, even being a three, I'm really aware of what, um, how I think someone perceives my value to them. Right. So like, how am I valuable to my family member? How am I valuable to my boss? Like I'm always tracking that and checking in on that. So if that source of value comes from me being a problem solver or helping people fix things or being, you know, so the, the person who can get the job done, um, <clears throat> I feel a lot of responsibility to do that because I, I use it to like feed my ego. But I also, if it conflicts with like what I want to do and how at that moment, a lot of time that's, that's what it looks like. It's like, I have a really hard time not doing what I want to do. <laughs> like a really, really, really hard time. Even if I'm like asking my friends for advice or I just, I know what I need to do. I just will always do what I want to do basically. So I think that shows up in my, in the, the tribe versus self too. Like I'm, I'm hyper aware of what needs to be done and what I need to do. It's just normally going to lose out to what I want to do. I see. So you strive for win-win, but if there is a no win, if, if it's, if someone yeah. has to lose, it's not going to be you. Yes. Especially yeah. if you're a three also. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's pretty much exactly what it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Got it. Um, so you have masculine TE, um, 
that means you perceive the tribe as threatening or aggressive and then you see yourself as like not the victim but you're like soft and cuddly and you know like you're harmless but in reality it's the masculine DEs that are aggressive um what has been your experience been like with that yeah this is crazy to me um so this is one of the things that was like most shocking about my typing and I and I've I like I never had the language for what this was but I people almost always say like when they first meet me or like when they first started working with me or something that they were intimidated by me and scared of me. And that just blows my mind because I feel like so much of my identity is tied to making sure that people feel like I feel approachable to people. Um, and I guess I'm a little disconnected on that, but <laughs> I, I definitely like, um, I feel like I do, like I can show up in a space with a lot of confidence. And I think that that a lot of times my gauge for knowing if, if I'm confident is if other people view me as confident. So there's a little something happening there, but like, I always feel like I'm, <laughs> I, don't know. I honestly didn't know that like people didn't view me as like totally like soft, cuddly, like submissive, movable person. I didn't know that. Like I really, I could, I could see where someone would look at me and be like, oh, she looks like, you know, maybe she's confident and like is supposed to be here in this space. I don't think it ever looked like, you know, meek or anything like that. But um, yeah, to learn that, like, I actually, it's like somewhat like threatening is really wild to me. <laughs> it's really wild. Yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of people are, are confused about that. Like, like who are uh, masculine TE and feminine FI. Um, one of my best friends at kind of looks like you actually. <laughs> she's an mm -hmm. ESFP, but I think she's play blast, consume sleep, and I think she is um, um, I think she's a type eight enneagram, not type three. Mm -hmm. So she always tells me like I can't make any female friends. They think I'm too aggressive, and and then and it's like and she's like, but I'm so so I'm so friendly and stuff, and I'm like, I'm like no, I'm like okay. I'm like first of all, okay, I I like her. We're best. We're like we're she's one of my best friends. I like her because she's aggressive. Like that's why I like you. I would not be hanging with you if you weren't aggressive. Because <laughs> like when it's like um Dave and Shan, like they they had a video once where Dave was saying, "Yeah, the tribe they're not they're not threatening. They're not aggressive." When when they when Dave says he sees like um like an aggressive person, he thinks it's like poking a bear, and then he wants them to growl at him because he thinks it's hilarious. And then that's kind of like me too. Like when I see like someone that's aggressive, I'm like, "Oh, this person's like really aggressive." I'm like, "Excellent! Now I can like poke at them to make them yeah. like." To make them like growl, you know, like make them like. So, okay. I actually am, if you can answer just like a little for me, yeah. this yeah. seeing the tribe as a threat. I've been, I've been trying to like sit with that and understand what that means, but could you like, how do you, like, what does that look like? I guess. Like if you see the tribe as a threat, it means like you see them as stronger than you or someone that can harm you potentially or cause harm or 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 control you <clears throat> so if and then if you're feminine fi then you would see yourself as the the person that is the, the weaker one mm -hmm. so because you see the tribe as someone that is threatening or out to get you then you rather hit them first before they get you you know yeah. um, so that's and and I've, I've practiced that personally myself i'm like what would happen if i pictured someone as threatening how would i behave i'm like yeah if I perceive as someone like a scummy and they're trying to like, out to get me, of course I would be aggressive towards them. So, so then when I put myself in, in, in the shoes of uh, you guys, then I'm like, oh, okay, I see what you guys, I see why you guys act that way all the time. But then, but then, but then like when I thought about it too, I'm like, but then again, when you guys perceive someone as like really friendly, let's say you know them already for a long time, then the feminine FI comes out and you guys are like extremely warm and friendly. It's like my, my, my friend who's like kind of like you, she is like that. Like she always like she calls me. She's like, "Yo, Kendrick, I miss you." I'm like, "Oh, she's so nice." But then I can also see that she's aggressive to other people. So you know, like, so can you okay. share a little bit about yourself in that context? You know. Okay. Yes, <laughs> that helped. Um, that helped me visualize and understand. So yeah, I think. <clears throat> let me. I'm trying to think of a good way to to frame that up. Um, 
Well, definitely being really, really soft around, you know, the people that I, I know and trust. People that I don't know and trust, I always, it feels like I'm always on the defense of seeing how they're going to react to me. So, and I don't even necessarily, and cause like, I'm not very um, conflict heavy person and I don't like to fight with people or anything, but I do, I think I've become really aware of how much aggression that they have and and if it's any, if any of it's going to come towards me, then I have to be prepared for that basically. And I think that's kind of more what it looks like. It's not so much like I'm, you know, ready to fight anybody who is like slightly disrespectful to me. A lot of the times I can just completely ignore it because I probably saw it coming and I've like emotionally detached in a way. Um, but if I like, I'm thinking of like, you know, meeting in a new friend group dynamic with people that I don't know. I definitely will be tracking the people that I feel in that circumstance have the most um, likely chance of being confrontational or trying to, uh, I don't know, assert some sort of dominance over me. I think I, I am always aware of that because I would, I don't even know what the opposite of that would be like <laughs> just assuming that everybody is going to be like pleasant all the time I don't know I don't know what the opposite of that is but um I don't think I do it because <laughs> yeah. uh, people with feminine DE we, we assume everyone is like weak and friendly so we have to like mm -hmm. we have to tippy toe around them we're like oh we don't want to hurt their feelings because I'm the threat like you know don't mess with me so I'm gonna be nice to you so that you can't like, we can't hurt you you know it's oh like, no I, I have never felt okay yeah I don't yeah. feel that <laughs> yeah so like when you meet someone that's like double feminine and they look like friendly actually they, they they're they're like that because inside they feel like they can hurt you so they have to like damn that's crazy actually yeah, yeah. wow you could ask one of your friends that who's like double feminine or like yeah. masculine feminine they'll be like so you don't see people as like threatening that you see yourself as a threat and you feel like you're gonna hurt other people like hurt people's feelings or something <laughs> I, I bet you a lot of them will probably like yeah you know i'm like trying to tippy toe around people like that's why that family, yeah. you know, so. Okay, that makes so much sense. And that's like, I also feel like too, at the same, similar to that, I feel like being like really, really nice like that is very vulnerable and exposing to you. Like that is, um, I would, I me doing that is like giving up a lot of power and um, like giving up a lot of like security of myself because yeah, okay, wow, this is really, duh. I'm just like explaining what you just said to me, but like, that's interesting. <laughs> I think when you have masculine DI, you don't need to gain power. You just don't want to hurt people. So, mm. you, like, because you have feminine DI, right? Like, what are you going to, are you going to be using that to go against people? Probably not. Because, like, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. so, yeah, it, it's your masculine TE, right? So, you know, so you, you always use your masculine functions to, like, to fight people, right? Like, you're, right. You, for example, you have masculine NI. It's fourth. But you have it, so you have yeah. more confidence on using that than your SE, maybe. You know? Yeah. Because he's feminine, right? Yeah. So, like, you'll fight people over concepts, but not facts, because you might for have forgotten the facts already. With yeah. Kind of, yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, totally. That's, yeah. that's spot on. Yeah. Um. So, since we're a topic of masculine and I, um, this is going to be your life problem. Uh, okay. So, masculine and I. Uh, it's masculine, so you can see it. So, you can see, like, the future, and you can kind of plan uh, yeah. Especially you, you have double masculine and T blast. That means you can plan for other people. <laughs> it's kind of weird. It's weird because you're self above tribe, but then you can't plan for yourself because because mm -hmm. uh, your yeah. NIFI is like fourth, right? Um, can you talk about your struggles with like control, like being controlled by like the 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 system or the organization? You know, like there's too much rules. There's too much like control. You know, like can can you talk about like that struggle with that? Yeah. Um, I, I guess to a certain degree, I've always felt like I, no matter what I will say in control, like I, <laughs> the, the threat of being controlled is interesting because it's, it's a threat, but it's almost, it's not because when I feel like I, and not in control, I gain it in whatever way that I can. Like, I'm always like trying to, to do control. Um, it, even if sometimes that control is like not, <laughs> how do I put this? 
Um, sometimes when I feel like I'm not in control of a situation, I just like will completely emotionally detached because that's me gaining control, right? It's like, no matter what, there's that uh, that attempt of me to um, disassociate or separate myself from the system that's controlling me, even if it's just me thinking it in my head. Um, but like, realistically, like talking about work and stuff, I will simply not keep a job or keep a place that makes me feel like I am bound to whatever. Um, I have to be given a lot of freedom. I structure is good in some ways for me, but I have to be able to like bounce in and out of it and around it. Like I just can't, um, I can't commit to like to fully like being controlled in that way. Um, and like, I, even in relationships, sometimes I can see this is like, I don't know, kind of hard to get into words, but I, it is kind of sounds kind of bad, but like, I would net, I don't, I have never given up like full control in a relationship ever. Um, there's, and this is some, a little bit of threeness too, um, with like the being disconnected from your heart and emotions, like there, there's going to be pieces of me that are always going to be inaccessible. <laughs> um, it would take a lot and like a lot of trust, a long standing relationship where I'm very, very comfortable that I will probably only ever have one of in my life if I'm lucky, um, that where I would feel like I could give up full control of myself to somebody else. Like that's just mm, simply not going to happen. That sounds like I would die <laughs> at some point. I don't know why or how, but it would. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. I think a lot of EPs feel the same way as, as you do. Um, I, I did, I interviewed this one girl who's an ESFP. Um, she was super honest about control. It was really interesting. She said that she thought her boyfriend was cheating on her. So she was getting him to show her all his like text messages and stuff and emails. And I'm like, and she realized she was like the crazy one. And I was like, <laughs> And like, you know, like God bless her honesty. Like I absolutely love her honesty. Um, but uh, I, I like how like EPs are the controlling type. Because if you talk to IJs who seem controlling, they actually like being controlled. They, they're only controlling because no one else is doing it. It's, you know, someone has to take that role, right? Like, yeah. um, like I, I met this one IJ guy who wanted to travel with me and he was showing me stupid Excel sheet. I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to, I don't want to travel like that with like, every part of the day has like a schedule that's so like I don't I hate I would hate that for like uh travel uh you know a travel experience yeah. so I told him like a counter plan and then he just became completely submissive I'm like what the hell it's so weird and then like I work in fitness so I had like a client and then he, he's like an ISTJ he said yeah I, I need people to tell me what to do I like being told what to do and I'm like that's so weird like like IJs like they don't care about like losing control control to them is like awesome so it's like a matter of like perspective. So like as an EP, I'm thinking, where am I at work feeling controlled? And like, where where is it where I'm just, I made it up in my head, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, wh what's really happening in the workplace that makes that person try to control the situation? And how am I potentially causing chaos so that they have to take the role of control, you know? Because it's, essentially yeah. it's like really your fault, right? As an EP, like you probably did something to, yeah. to, to, to make them like want to control you, right? So yeah, you have to think. Like for example, when my girlfriend gets upset at me, she's like, "Oh, you didn't clean up." I'm like, oh, "Yeah, that's my fault." You know, I didn't clean up after the space, right? So right, like, right. that's on me, right? Like so. Oh, yeah, that was that was a lot of um, <clears throat> struggles that I had with my mom. I'm thinking like in my adolescence when it came to control. It's like she was just making me be a functioning adult, you know. Yeah. And I feel like too, like um, with maybe, I mean you know, I'm still learning, but sleep last maybe could have something to do with that maybe. But like, I was just not like, I was everywhere, but doing like stuff for me and stuff that needed to be done. Like, <laughs> I don't know. And so I'm also in the Enneagram self-preservation um, second. So it's not, it's not necessarily a blind spot where I'd be neurotic about stuff like that. Um, but um, I also just kind of don't care about it. So like, I would not be doing homework or do a project, like wait to the very last minute to do it, or I wouldn't clean my room. And it's like, then my mom would come in and be like, you need to like do this, this, and this. And it was just like this anvil on my chest of just like, oh my God, you're just trying to like, yeah, like you're bringing like, you're just like 
it was just this awful dynamic that, yeah. And, and honestly, I'm a, I'm a mostly functioning person. I can t- get care, take care of stuff and do things. But if I get like gentle reminders, even from people or like, you know, um, the slight indication that maybe I, I need to bring a little like structure to something, then it's just like, ugh, no. <laughs> <laughs> So um, as you got older then, did you have more appreciation like for your mom and kind of like realized like you were like the the chaos person that, you know, (laughs) kind Um, of, kind of, you're still at three, so you don't want anyone to feel like they're winning, but like, you know. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, okay. So definitely what my mom was like asking me to do was just like normal stuff. Right. I think the way of communicating it was awful. So right. there's lots of that, um, you know, but I, what I am thankful for, and she really didn't like, honestly, she didn't try to force that much control. Like she was a pretty unstructured, unstruct, unstructured parent, but, um, you know, anytime she did t- try to t- try to bring that in, it felt like times 10 on me. Right. Um, so I, but the, the thing about having a parent who's not going to, you know, micromanage you or really like be breathing down your neck is that I got to have a lot of those hands-on learning experiences about life and through life because I had to do it myself. There was no one, she wasn't going to show me how to do everything and, um, you know, give me like all the advice on what I needed to do. She didn't really do a whole lot of that. So the the plus side of that is like, you know, I got to learn how to do a lot of shit by living and um, lived experiences. So when she wasn't exerting a ton of control, it was cool. And even when she was like, it was not that bad. She was just a bad communicator. That's all it was. Gotcha. Yeah, I guess maybe she's energy dumb because, um, you know, um, energy dumb. Dave and Chan always make fun of energy dumb saying, because they're, they're both energy dumb too, Dave and Chan, saying that they ruin conversations, you know? So <laughs> um, so that, that could have been it. Like, who knows? Um, yeah. So... Anyways, um, last question for you, uh, Michaela, and then we'll wrap up the interview. Uh, my last question is with your sexual modalities. You mm-hmm. are tester and you are, or sorry, you're visual and you're tester. Okay. So visual is a given. Um, it's learning from seeing and also having a visual memory. And then tester is with smell. And yours is specifically with extrovert sensing. So it's like trying different smells. And smells <laughs> also taste, right? So it's also food. So mm-hmm. um, first part of the question is, can you share a little bit of how you um, learn from visuals and also your visual memory and then second part of the question is what's your experience like with um, trying new smells new tastes um, having that tester uh, sexual modality hmm visual that's so interesting I mean outside of like the the general description of how people are visual learners like yeah all of that applies to me like seeing things visually helps me retain it better and seeing concepts visually helps me also seeing people like um I was I was never really good at math um but I would have to see somebody else do it I would have to see like the actual action of it happening like what they were writing how they were writing it like that that side of visual was like super important I can't if you're just telling me I can't so yes to that um also visual learning my like environment as well like learning where and I've moved recently and um I'm much more likely to remember things by like visual landmarks as opposed to actually knowing what street I'm on (laughs) a lot of times I don't um but I will know like whereabouts it is to my old apartment or something so there's that um experimenting and learning through taste and smell that's really interesting um I don't really know. I'm, uh, I've, it, it doesn't yeah. have to be learning. It could just be like, because oh. you, you want to experiment with like different tastes and smell. Oh, like experimenting. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um. So I'm all, I've always been really big on perfumes and fragrances. Like since I was, I asked for it every year for Christmas since, since I was a kid. And I know a lot about, I, I say I know a lot about, but I don't, I guess I don't in the grand scheme of things. Um, I, use a lot of perfume. I'm recommending it. It's one of those things that I'm like a broken record about. If people ask me about, I have like a set brands that I really like, and, um, I'm really big on it. I actually, this is quick story. I'll try to be quick. Um, recently I got into an Uber and it was like, 
dead silent. He like said hi when I got in, whatever. And we're like going down the street like three minutes. And he just like out of nowhere was like, your perfume is so loud. He like yelled at me for it. And I was like, oh God, I'm so sorry. But that's the thing is like, I love perfumes. I love lotions that smell. And I just like, um, someone once said that uh, they wanted someone to um, smell them before they saw them. And that's definitely me. Um, I also really like to buy perfumes when I go on vacations because I will use it like on vacation and then I'll smell it like later and it'll like instantly bring back that memory. Like smell is really powerful. So anyway, I'm like, can like hijack that experience. I'm going to do it. I love candles that smell like food too, or like coffee or something because it's like, it smells good, but it's also like making me think about eating or drinking. So yeah, I love it. I love smelling other people too. <laughs> it's probably weird to admit, but it's true. I love to like know what somebody, you know, cause like people have like a personal scent aside from whatever perfume or cologne that they wear. And I love to know what that scent is. Right. Yeah. And you know what they say, like girls know what like their guy smells like. So um, yeah. Um, and then I, I like um, how your description of like how the smell takes you back to that memory when you were in that place. So that that's super cool also. Um, I would probably die if I was near you because I'm like super allergic to to smell. But like, I know it's I, bad. That's why I do feel bad. Like when that Uber driver said that, I was like, oh god, I did it. Like I'm so I'm so used to overdoing perfume, and it's like uh, actually an active habit that I'm trying to fix because people are sensitive to it. And I don't I don't want anyone choking around me, you know. Yeah, but yeah, I would be one of them. Like <laughs> I would be dead for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Michaela, um, thanks for coming out and doing this interview and sharing more about yourself. Um, I know you use a lot of Enneagram analogies, but that's fine because I think that it, it actually enhanced the, the explanation of, of your type uh, from a language that you understood. So I think that that was perfect. All right, so take care and I'll see you around the, the groups and stuff. Okay, thanks, bye.